how are you today? This is uh, God Talk, and I am Pastor Dan, Pastor Dan Smith. Happy you found us today. I hope you'll give us the next 28 minutes or so as we wrestle with always the same main topic, the character of God. There are other preachers, and I can certainly preach on many other topics, but uh, here on God Talk, we are on this, wrestling with the hard questions and the big truths about the character of God. And uh, so we'll see what you think of the issues today, putting a couple little ideas together and uh, wrestle with this issue. Is God kind of a reluctant God? And we'll put that with, uh, what about the Old Testament God, those two ideas together. I was taking a mission trip uh, down to Salusi University in uh, Zimbabwe, wonderful place that I just love. Haven't been there for a while now. It takes a lot of money and time to fly down there. But we went several times for a few years where I was trying to help them out. So we had maybe 10 of us. We had a uh, computer cable. We were laying a network of computers there for their school. We had, we had a lot of stuff. We were taking garden seeds. <laughs> I thought we would get three or 400. We had a little competition at uh, La Sierra Adventist Academy. We got 9,000 garden packets of seeds. Now we had to pick these in bags. So we were way overweight. We had a lot of stuff, and I was worried that we would have to pay uh, a lot of customs duty to get all this stuff in. So some genius decided that told me I should take some uh, seized candy and give that to the uh, customs people when I got into Bulawayo there in Zimbabwe. I had never done that before. I didn't want to do it, but well, I guess I don't want to be so pure, whatever it takes to get all this stuff in. So <laughs> I went and bought two boxes of seized candy downtown Riverside, California. But the more I thought about it, I said, I don't want to do that. You know, what if I get over there and I get the one honest person who's <laughs> in the customs? And now it goes into the newspaper. Adventist pastor bribes government officials. You know, that, uh, bad idea. Let me just trust God to work it out. So I took those two boxes and gave them to secretaries of the conference office. And I said, here, <laughs> you have these. So we got into the airport. Uh, other people were going over land. I was the one flying in. And I had all this stuff with me. And uh, it looks like I'm going to have to pay some. And uh, the president of the college is right out there, but he can't come in. I said, the president's out there. This is all to help a university here in your country. This is not for me. I'm not selling this. We're giving this to the school. And the customs lady whispered to me and said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist also. I'm trying to help you. Just wait a minute. Was I glad I didn't show up with boxes of seized candy and try to bribe my fellow Adventist church member? And she went to the back and she worked it out and I think I had to pay $60. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. $60. Yes, I'll pay. Do we have to bribe God? Is God a reluctant God who only is willing to be kind to you, give you the permit you need, give you the right taxes, get you a medical license? In my country where I grew up, you had to some, and look, the rumor is you had to pay money to get your medical license. Pass the test. In order to get equipment into our country for hospitals and for media projections, usually some money had to change hands. I don't even know if some of the things that I have done around the world did somebody have to pay to get me in or to get my stuff in. I don't want to know. Does God need offerings? Famous stories in Judges chapter 11 in Jephthah. Jephthah has a tough beginning. His mother's a prostitute. His uh, the brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters, they're, quote, legitimate, and he's illegitimate. They did not want this son of a prostitute, their father's embarrassing mistake, to be in the house with them. So he's often out in the woods, became a tough warrior. But when Israel was surrounded by enemies, who did they want? They wanted Jephthah. So they came to Jephthah, and they said, we want you to be our judge. You be the leader of Israel, and you fight our enemies for us. 
And he said, how do I know that as soon as I uh, win a big battle for you, you'll throw me out and get rid of me? He said, no, 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 no. You're our judge. We want you. You're the one. He gets an army together, but even with all the best, his army is a fraction of the army that is surrounding them. And he goes to God and he says, if you will just bless me, God, I will give you the first thing that comes out the door of my house. I don't know if he had an idea what that would be. Maybe he thought it would be his dog or something. I do not know. We'll have to ask him someday. God gives them a great victory. He and his leaders of the army are dancing up the aisle, up the sidewalk, up to his house, and the tambourines, and they're happy and celebrating. And the daughter comes out, beautiful daughter, his only daughter, and she comes up and she hugs her father, and then he says, oh, I made a vow that if God blessed me, I would give the first thing that came out the door. It's you. I will have to do what God, what I promised God. She says, okay, <clears throat> you have to do what your vow was. But let me spend a couple months with my girlfriends. I'll never have children. I'll never marry. I'll never have this pleasure. And then I'll come back. She went away for two months. She came back. And this terrible verse that said, he did to her as he had vowed. How does God feel about this? It's not just wrong. He puts in the Bible, you know, you do not... You do not make blood vows like this. But ultimately, what's heartbreaking to God is what it says about their picture of God. He said, I'm not like the other pagan gods. That's the pagan gods. They get angry when you sin and you have to offer them sacrifices in order to turn their gods around. I am not like them. I am not like the pagan gods. I am not a reluctant God. Heartbreaking to God, as it would be to any of us. You don't have to do these things to win me over. The famous line in a Jerry Maguire movie, I've never seen the movie, but I've heard about this line. And he's uh, been a problem and done bad things to this girl. He comes crawling back and comes in the door and starts to make his little speech. And she says, never mind, you had me at hello. You already had me. We don't have to bludgeon God into this. He's not a reluctant God. It's the way it got it. Jesus has to come down and show that uh, you do not have to do these kinds of things in order to get God to forgive. All you have to do is come home. The prodigal son just came home, and the father forgave him. Didn't have to do any sacrifices, pay the money back, or anything. God just takes you back. The idea that Jesus has to die in order for God to forgive, that that is the ultimate offering God is a reluctant God. He has to have a big sacrifice. He has to have the sacrifice of his own son in order to forgive. No, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing before he had died. God did not need to see blood in order to forgive. He is not a reluctant God. And, of course, the story in Matthew where the man says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make my son clean. You can heal my servant, or whatever it was. If you are willing, you just if I am willing, you're questioning whether I am willing. You do not have to wonder whether I am willing. I am always willing. You don't have to wonder about me. So that has to mean, number one, that the cross is not something that God demanded. God is not a reluctant God. The cross is not for God. The cross is not our Jephthah's daughter in order to have God do a victory for us. That's the one thing it cannot be. God is not a bloodthirsty God. He doesn't need to be appeased, pacified, somehow satisfied in any way. The cross is God's way of giving to the world, not our sacrifice to God. You have to be careful. Go to the book of Psalms in chapter 51. David's committed murder and adultery. If anybody needed to offer sacrifices to God in order to get God to come back, it had to be David. Prophet walks in and he tells a little story about the king who took the poor man's sacrifice rather than his own animal to, to give as a meal to the guest. And David said, Who did that? Whoever that is dies today. And the prophet says, Thou art the man. 
murder and adultery. David, oh. Write Psalm 51, God, purge me, forgive me, I'm so sorry. Create in me clean spirit. Don't take the Holy Spirit away from me. Those are the verses we know well. But you come down to verse 16 and it says, I would give you sacrifices, but I know you don't want them. <laughs> yes, he does. What do you mean he doesn't want sacrifices? Sacrifices were his idea from back in Cain and Abel all the way down, Adam and Eve. And yes, there are times when God wants sacrifices, but evidently there are times when God doesn't want it. He says, what do you want? Verse 17, what God wants is a broken and a contrite heart. He wants a broken heart. He wants someone who comes with empty hands. You're not bringing your little gifts and offerings. Somehow win over a reluctant God. He says, just come. Empty. Prodigal son, just come empty. Don't try to pay God off. Abel brings a lamb pointing forward to Jesus. Cain tries to bring his own works. He goes, I don't want any of that. I don't want your sacrifices. And then God says an interesting thing. David says an interesting thing in verse 19. He says, then, then I will give you righteous sacrifices. Evidently, the same sacrifice, if you give it to God in a way to try to win God over to you, it is an unrighteous sacrifice and God hates it. And he says, I want nothing to do with these sacrifices. When Jesus uh, died, they said there were 250,000 lambs being killed every Passover. The creek ran red with blood, trying to win over the favor of God. If one lamb works, let's give 250,000 lambs. Sacrifices and sacrifices to win over the heart of God. He says, you don't have to do anything to win over my heart. I am not a reluctant God. The purpose of the sacrifice is not to win me over. Jephthah did not have to give his daughter in order to win God over. And you and I don't have to give the sacrifice of Jesus, his own son, to win the heart of God. God is giving the son to us, not us to God. Be careful. Ten Commandments. If you keep the Ten Commandments in order to win God over, God says, unrighteous sacrifice. If you go to church to win God over, if you give money to win God over, God, if I do this, will you do this? God hates it all. Hates it all. After you come to grace with empty hands and just say, God, I need grace. And you receive grace. Then the same Ten Commandments, the same going to church, the same giving an offering to God is a righteous sacrifice. If you give it here for the purpose of winning over God's heart, it says something that God hates. If you give it here in response to grace, God loves it. Same. Yes, God wants us to live a holy, righteous life, but never to win him over. That's why it says in Romans 10, 4, God is the end of the law. No more. No more. Now we come to Revelation 17. And it says at the end of Revelation, there will be this prostitute, whore, harlot, woman. Pure woman in Revelation 12 stands for God's pure church. Revelation 17 stands for God's false church. What does it mean to be a prostitute? The prostitute will not give you love from love. The prostitute only gives love with payment. And God says, this church is a false church. It's a prostitute church. Anytime you and I think that God is a kind of God that we have to pay off, we have to appease, we have to pacify, we have to win him over, we have to change him from here to here by getting more people to pray or whatever else, one way or the other, we are trying to somehow change the heart and mind of God by our logic, by our arguments, by sacrifices or even the sacrifice of Jesus. We are part of that prostitute church of Revelation 17. Anytime we think God is a reluctant God, we have done something bad to the character of God. Be careful. You do not have to be part of a medieval church in order to be part of that prostitute woman. You can be in the remnant church keeping the right day of worship, but if you are doing that in some way to win over the heart of God, Heartbreaking to God, and you're in the false church. 
Well, we segue a little. What about all the other hard stories in the Old Testament? Why does God use thunder and lightning and smoke on top of a mountain? People were so scared of God, they said to Moses, don't let him talk like that to us anymore. You talk to us. You can listen to God, and then you come and tell us what he says. But if we keep hearing from God like that, we're going to die. It says they ran away from God. Why would God want that? How do you fit that in with the God of the New Testament? Jesus, Christmas morning. God who was kind, who children crawled all over him, came and touched lepers and touched women and, and people who were struggling in the down Cast, outcast of society. How do we put these ideas together, this Old Testament God and the Jesus of the New Testament? Uzzah reaches up and touches the ark, trying to keep it from falling over. What's wrong with that? Dead like that. God said, don't touch holy things. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Little criticism of church leaders. Who hasn't done that? the pastor, conference people, the general conference, who hasn't criticized somebody? Ground opens up and swallows them, and not just them, their families and children and everybody. God does that. The Amalekites, God says to destroy the Amalekites, destroy every one of them, destroy their children, their wives, their king, their animals, scorched earth. Is that the best we can do? About God, Lot's wife. Walking out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God said, don't look back. She looks back for a second. Pillar of salt. Is that necessary, God? What about the flood? I don't know how bad these people were or how many there were. But God decides he has to have rain for 40 days, drowns every one of them. And tell you, got only eight people left out of the whole world. Necessary. What does all this tell you about God? Read the Old Testament prophets. And there are passages you just... <clears throat> you read Isaiah. I preached a whole sermon on Isaiah, and I had an associate pastor get pretty unhappy with me. And maybe I didn't use the best words, but I was trying to say, these are hard passages. God says, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to do this to you. There are places where he says, I'm going to roll your mother off cliffs. I'm going to molt you in molten silver. I'm going to do this and this and this. How do we fit this in with a God of love? He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Is that what God is really like? And it's not just in the Old Testament. People say, well... Maybe in the Old Testament, but God gradually is uh, <laughs> upping his game, and God is learning what works and doesn't work, and he, he finally decides, okay, no more of that fear stuff. I'm going to be a loving God now. No. Be careful about the idea of an evolving God. We have in Acts 5, two people come in, Ananias and Sapphira. They claim that they have sold some property, and they're bringing this offering in. Is that all the offering you promised? Yes, one's dead. Next one come in. Is this all the offering you're supposed to give? Next one's dead. They drag them out. If God killed everybody instantly who didn't give a full offering, tithe and offerings, where would we be? <laughs> where would you be in me? Too bad. What about Revelation 14? In the same passage that says that God has an everlasting gospel of good news to go all over the world. And God is unrelentingly good news. And we're supposed to give that message all over the world. A few verses later, it talks about the uh, smoke and the torment, everlasting torment, and the smoke of their torment rising up day and night forever. In the last few pages of the book of the Bible, what are we going to do? But here at God Talk, we say that God is only good all the time. 
The Lord is righteous in all that he does. And we're going to say at the end of the judgment that God was right and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus was Lord and that God was good. So what are we going to do with that? Well, let's try to get some answers. Maybe I can get all of them today. Number one, can we say that Jesus is the last word? Yes, we believe that the Holy Spirit has inspired all the Bible writers, every prophet. Yes, Holy Spirit, and they spoke as God put words and ideas and concepts into their mouth and into their mind. But Jesus is the last word about God. I have had some fun with my fellow Islam brethren. They worship God. They love God. They are absolutely sincere in their belief. And they want me to believe in Muhammad as the prophet of God. And I said, my friend, Muhammad may be fantastic. I've not read everything he's written. But as a Christian, if I have to choose between a prophet who is speaking for God in Christianity where God himself comes down and speaks and says, God is like this, I choose Jesus. I revere Daniel and Moses and Abraham and all the other writers of the Bible and prophets who have spoken for God. And they spoke truth. But evidently there is a more sublime truth. Jesus. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God except the one who's at the Father's side has made him known. Even the angels who were there right there next to God and can say an awful lot, they cannot say everything because they're not God himself. Jesus has been with God forever. There's never a time when there was no Jesus, God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father except through me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Exactly alike. Hebrews chapter 1. In the olden days, God spoke through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken through his Son, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is exactly God. There is nothing about God. One person said to me, Pastor Dan, I know Jesus, but I would, I like to see God. I want to see what God is like. I said, there is no more. There is nothing of God that is not already what you see in Jesus. No. There is no unchrist likeness, it said, in God. There's no ungod likeness in Christ. They are exactly the same. So evidently, the Old Testaments were good, but not exact. Only Jesus. In Jesus was the fullness of God. Colossians 1, verse 15. Number two, God has always loved. Can we just agree on that? Whatever else we want to say about God, God is love. One writer says that is the defining value. 1 Corinthians 13, this great description of love, that's God. God is love. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hebrews 13, 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is love. It's all he ever is. Malachi 3, 6. I change not. Jer Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Both in this, that you know God and you understand me. My unfailing love. That's what God is. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the greatest of these is love. That's the Father. Okay? Put that anchor down. Number three, God speak to people at the level of where they are at. Maybe the most helpful concept to help me unlock the Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament God, Jesus divide. And probably, I probably heard it mostly from people who study Kohlberg, but it works with any, what they call stage models. Irene Kuhn wrote an article about it in the review many years ago. I got this, first of all, from uh, Dick Wynn. He wrote a paper about it. If you study these various stage models, Kohlberg would look at children and as they grow, his own children, and they responded to different motivations. It's called a theory of moral motivation. Children, first of all, only understand punishment. If you do this, I will punish you. Gradually, they learn positive motivation, like I'll buy you ice cream, or I'll let you go to the movies, or I'll take you to the baseball game if you'll just do this. 
Get good grades, I'll give you money, the tooth fairy, whatever. Gradually, levels three, levels four are more of the same and just more adult versions. Gradually, we have a law and order, and people pay taxes, not because they really accept the concept, they just they want to live in peace, they don't want to be in trouble with their neighbors, they mow their yard, they pay their taxes, they drive on the right side of the road, they wear the seat belt, they follow the laws. Too much trouble to be fighting, paying fines, and going to jail. And so they are doing what somebody bigger than them tells them. The football coach tells them, you play my game or you'll be on the bench. Okay. And so they get motivated by people above them, giving them grades, giving them salary, threatening to fire them, putting them on the team, getting them into medical school, or not having to be in trouble with the government. It's all because of somebody above you. It's called extrinsic motivation. Some other people... You're doing it to keep them happy. Kohlberg said there was a level five and a level six where now extrinsic motivation, outer motivation becomes inward, intrinsic. Now you begin to be altruistic, to do good because for goodness sake. And you treat people with equality and women with equality because you have decided you're not going to discriminate based on gender anymore and something of compassion, and you see poor, and you give people health care coverage, and you, you do whatever you can do out of, out of compassion and altruism. And then they said there's a level seven you learn as Jesus, okay. And Kohlberg and these people who are writing about Kohlberg, now when these people now apply it to Scripture, they will say, God speaks to level where people will understand. 75, 70-some percent never go beyond level four. And if you're in level four, you cannot see or understand levels five and six. That makes no sense to you. And so you think, you vote, you write, you speak, you relate to the world based on the level where you are, and you don't understand a higher level. And so God has to bring his picture of who he is and his laws and understandings to the level where people will understand. We do it with our little kids. I said to my little kids, don't do this or daddy will. I don't want to relate them to them that way now when they're 26 and 28 years old. I say drive safe and we grow. Read scripture in that way. Some of these hard stories, that we call them emergency measures. God is speaking to them at the level of which they understand. They're slaves coming out of slavery. But now we want to come to Jesus, and Jesus says, go by this. Turn the other cheek. Live by the golden rule. Anyway, that's the best we can do today. This is God Talk. Thanks for coming.